I would like to start with and Dr. Bergren, lead specialist. Hi, I'm Dr. Ruth Bergren. I'm a professor of medicine here at UT Health. I'm an infectious disease specialist, and I'm a member of Team Health Confianza. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Dr. Rosenthal. Hi, sorry, I was chatting. Um, I'm Jason Rosenfeld, Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine and Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics and Implementing Director of Health Confianza. It's great to see you all today. Thank you very much. Kathy Case? Hi, I'm Katie Case. I am an Assistant Professor at the REACH Center at UT Health San Antonio and a co-investigator with the Health Confianza team. Thank you very much. Uh, our didactic speaker, Dr. Verdusco Gutierrez. Monica Verdusco Gutierrez. I am the Chair of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation here at UT Health San Antonio and run our uh, post-COVID recovery clinics. Thank you very much. We have a case presenter, uh, Dr. Patterson. Hi, I'm Jan Patterson. I'm Professor of Medicine Infectious Diseases at UT Health San Antonio. Uh, we have Dr. Sanka. Hi, I'm Ratna Sanka. I'm an Associate Professor of Neurology at UT Health San Antonio. Thank you very much. Dr. Barton. I think Dr. Barton might not have joined us yet, but I did see Dr. Pilarusetti. Hello, hi, uh, this is uh, Dr. Jay Sripilarisetti. I'm a cardiologist and physiologist at uh, UT Health San Antonio. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, these sessions are possible because of you, your interest, participation, and support. Your feedback is very important uh, for us. Also, I want to say thanks for all the ECHO team to make those sessions possible. Please complete the free ECHO survey that you receive when you register. Towards the end of the session, our team is going to send a link for an evaluation. Your feedback is very, very important for us. For this ECHO series, we offer the CME, CNE, Ethics Continuum Medical Education. So to obtain those credits, please follow up the instructions in the chat. And the activity code for today is 1008985. As a part of our, our agenda, we are going to have next didactics, long COVID and post-COVID syndrome. Following up, we are going to have a discussion of the cases a presentation and scenario. The case discussion is an important component of the ECHO model. Case-based learning is a one unique aspect for the ECHO model. We invite you please submit clinical and non-clinical cases. So finally, ECHO is all teach all learning environments. So we encourage you and invite you to participate in our conversation today. Uh, with no more from my end, I would like to move for our didactic, Dr. Valdisco Gutierrez. This is your space on your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me here today to talk about post-COVID conditions and long COVID. Again, you can get your CME, the information's in the chat box as well. Some of my disclosures. And I have 20 minutes to talk about something that I could probably talk about for 20 hours. And so I'm going to be speaking in fast forward mode, but also trying to get the most important uh, parts of long COVID, what we know, pathophysiology, who's it's impacting, you know, how do we assess and treat it? Because that's kind of information that you're getting with people at the front lines. So what are the right terms to use? Post-COVID conditions is the CDC definition, and that's when you have new returning or ongoing symptoms that are four more weeks after you've had COVID. Long COVID is the syndrome. Um, it's another word for post-COVID conditions. Uh, Post-acute sequela of SARS-CoV-2 or PASC, that was um, the NIH's term, and again, four weeks or more. The CDC has a very nice definition. The World Health Organization has a very nice definition also, and it is inclusive of people who get symptoms later on that they don't have to be within four weeks, just as long as it's related to either having COVID or presumed having COVID, knowing that a lot of people may have not had access to testing at the beginning, or even now, um, just because of social determinants of health. And then the term long hauler is usually it's uh, patients use that term for themselves. 
but I usually try to use um, patient first language. So I will say person with long COVID or person who is, you know, uh, dealing with symptoms related to post COVID conditions. And so I will stay away from the term long hauler. As far as pathophysiology, we know a lot about, you know, what happens when you get SARS-CoV-2 and the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor, and you have ACE2 receptors on all different parts of the, of the body. But one important part of this picture is that the PICs, the post-inflammatory cytokines that get taken, there's endothelial dysfunction, and then these inflammatory cytokines go to all the other systems in our body. And it's this inflammation that really causes some of the long-term issues and the multi-organ injury that we're seeing down the road. And also what's being impacted is the immune system as well. So what is exactly, you know, what do we know from the pathophysiology of long COVID? And there's so much data that's coming out now. And I think it's probably different for different people, but you know, there's some data on there's microclots that they're seeing in patients that may explain what's going on. And sometimes they're seeing it in these special, we don't even, I asked our pathology department, can we find this, look at this paper? And they're like, we don't have that kind of microscope. We can't do that. Um, people are having to go out of the country to get this done, but I've also heard about BQ scanning showing some microclots at being abnormal in that. In this study, they looked at immune, immunological dysfunction and patients were having uh, inflammatory mediators that were high months afterwards. So, you know, especially these interferon beta, interferon gamma, IL-6, and um, when they had these being increased, those were you know, 80% accurate for patients who are having long COVID symptoms. So definitely immune dysfunction. In this study, we know there's also, like I talked about, endothelial dysfunction, and there's persistent endothelial dysfunction. There is studies on development of autoantibodies, and not just to ACE2 autoantibodies, but other autoantibodies as well. We have seen studies on vagus nerve dysfunction, maybe even infection of the vagus nerve. And then mRNAs that are uh, affecting metabolic function. And so we know mitochondrial function. So we know that mitochondrial issues can lead to some of the fatigue that the patients are having. So what does recovery look like? And I will tell you the vast majority of my patients do not have these COVID lungs because the vast majority of patients we know have mild to moderate disease to start with and are not hospitalized and don't have that, but they still have long COVID symptoms. The, you know, there's some studies say 10 to 50%. The 50% is probably in the ones who had the more severe disease the studies now are closer to saying it's probably closer to 10%. Um, I was saying before at the beginning of when I saw clinic, everyone was non-vaccinated. And then when people were getting vaccinated, I saw a lot more unvaccinated people. And now I'm seeing a combination of both vaccinated and unvaccinated patients. And, um, and in this study, they looked at large data, lots of EHR data, and they looked at people who are over 20 or less than 20 and how do they, you know, what the ones who ended up being positive and ones who are being ended up being negative and then looked at their return to clinic and their symptoms that they had for up to 150 days afterwards. And so in these patients, they were, you can see there, what were the new symptoms that they had, including ones who were over 20 or less than 20. And the take home message in this one was that they said it was only 11% of patients, but I still think this is like a tweet, my own tweet, that 11% is high because, you know, we're saying there is now there's over 75 million Americans who've had COVID-19. So there's millions of people who could be having post-COVID conditions. So overall, it's about you know, 11% when you consider mild to moderate data that just came out recently from the UK where they've had the Omicron surge more recently and, you know, the BA2 as well, showing people who had triple vac vaccinations, about 11% were having ongoing symptoms with COVID. So, um, so still at risk, if you, even if you're vaccinated. And this is one of the first, okay, what are the symptoms that patients are going to have? This is one of the first studies that came out. So again, Fatigue, muscle body ache, shortness of breath, concentrating issues, inability to exercise. I really like um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So this put all those studies together. And again, we're going to see very similar things. You're going to see fatigue, headaches, 
attention disorder, hair loss, dyspnea, but this had 50 plus symptoms. So there's so many things that patients will come to your clinic and come complain about that can be related to COVID-19. And in this study had shown that this looked at patients over a year and what was happening over a year. So they had patients who were still symptomatic at two months. And we see that if you have symptoms for more than three months, it's probably going to last for a longer period of time. And then, so in these patients, 85% were still having symptoms at a year and that it's relapsing, remitting. And then these eight symptoms were actually increasing over the time. And the most common thing being neck pain, back pain, low, uh, low back pain, the paresthesias, bone and joint pain. So a lot of things that people will just be going to see their PCP, maybe a pain doctor, you know, with these kind of generalized complaints saying they've had pain and the pain's not worsening. So something to look out for and start asking about history of having COVID. Um, this one's kind of nice. I think it com combines what we know about. There's disrupted immunity that happens with COVID and everyone's immune system ask, acts a little differently. There's inflammation and nervous system dysfunction. Again, what we know with inflammation that cross the blood brain barrier. And this is where all the symptoms kind of cross over and you'll see and what goes to what. So I think it's kind of helpful to depict how these, how interrelated these symptoms are and to help patients understand how um, very disparate symptoms can be related. And it's not signaling that they have organ damage or heart problems per se, but there's actually a systemic effect that they're having from the inflammation and from um, immune system response. And that it really takes holistic approach to make a recovery. So you get a nice little picture of what you may see with patients as well. And um, these patients... There's autonomic dysfunction, and we'll talk a, lot, a little bit about that later, especially in cases, and I'll talk a little bit about studies for that. Pain, cognition, mood, and sleep disorders, definitely something that we see in exercise intolerance. And a lot of these people, you will see, you will give them tests, and their EKG normal, and their echo is normal, and um, you'll, they'll say, if I don't have cardiopulmonary disease, why can't I exercise? Why can't I do what I'm used to doing? And so... Um, there's now studies where they've done uh, invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And during, in these tests, they were both looking at central and peripheral blood extraction to see what was happening. And they had shown that ones who had COVID-19, who had had, you know, other tests were normal. When they did this, they had a marked reduction in their peak oxygen consumption peripherally rather than from a central. So usually they're looking central, but, and they're not usually drawing arterial blood gases, but this one they did. And they found that they had, um, again, decreased peak oxygen extraction peripherally. And they also had exaggerated hyperventilatory response during exercise. So that's another thing. Patients will feel like they are breathing really fast um, when they get, when they get tested or when they do exercise, you'll hear that as well. And this is another test, another study of cardiopulmonary stress testing when they had unexplained dyspnea and kind of, they had already gone through everything was normal, PFTs, CT, chest, chest x-rays. Most of these patients were not hospitalized. They were 45, so otherwise healthy. And then of when they did the, this test on 41 patients, only two were completely normal. And so they had significant abnormalities, again, decreased peak oxygen exemption, um, peak oxygen. And then also they had dysfunctional breathing in almost all the 15 out of 17 of the patients also had um, dysfunctional breathing or respiratory rates that went over 55. They also, one thing that we don't check, which we probably should, is entitled CO2. And a lot of those patients, all 61% had hypocapnia when they checked their entitled CO2. And about half of them met criteria for myalgic encephalomyelitis based on their exercise testing. So we know COVID's multi-system involvement. We have, again, this is a study where they looked at patients who had had before uh, control patients versus patients with POTS and versus patients who had PASC or long COVID. And again, the ones with POTS and PASC were very similar and they're having decreased CO2, they're having decreased cerebral blood flow, 
their um, entitled CO2 dropped. So if you had access to check that, that would be wonderful. And then they had all, you know, we know small fiber neuropathy, dysautonomia, and increased inflammatory markers. Autonomic impairment, that's something that, you know, I work with my neurologists and cardiologists who are on this call, thankfully, because, you know, it's a teamwork that makes the dream work. And we are not, you know, again, if patient has POTS, our traditional tests of echo, even kind of zeo patch are not going to be positive unless we're doing stand tests, 10 minute stand tests, lean tests. We're checking orthostatics, which a lot of patients don't get in most clinics um, to be able to find if they have the sustained heart rate increment, because we're finding this in a very a fair amount of patients that we're seeing. And so they will have orthostatic intolerance when they're up. That's when they feel dizzy. That's when they feel lightheaded. That's when they feel their heart race. Of course, they need cardiac um, workup for this. And some may be able to be diagnostic with just a stand test, and some may need a tilt test as well. And a lot of the management that we do is education, certain exercises, making sure they're drinking enough fluids, wearing compression garments, doing isometric exercises. And yes, there's also pharmacologic testing, um, this is a study that, again, goes with checking the entitled CO2 because sometimes when patients stand for 10 minutes, that will drop, and that might be the only abnormality when they're standing, but that is going to also impact cerebral blood flow and everything else and give them the symptoms. We have, through my national society, we have a multidisciplinary PASS collaborative. That's 37 long COVID clinics, and we've come together and we've worked on some papers a consensus guidance statements on treatments of certain parts of the symptoms. So the first paper that came out was on fatigue. That's open access. You can find it in the PM&R journal. And we give a lot of recommendations that we've come up together with, you know, how do you accept, uh, assess people with fatigue? Um, and then what are some of the treatments that can be done? And we have one for fatigue. We have another one for cognitive changes. We have another one for breathing and respiratory dysfunction. The next one that will be out is, we have a cardiac one, we have an autonomic dysfunction, we're working on a pediatric one, and then a neurologic one as well. Please learn about post-exertional malaise. So this is where we talk to the patients we tell, and you, because this is one of the cardinal symptoms that a lot of these patients will have. And what post-exertional malaise is, is that they will do an activity and they'll fi feel fine with that activity, but then they have the crash and burn cycle. So it actually, they may crash, within the next day or even, you know, two days later that might leave them bed bound or unable to do something. And so this is, um, you know, they have these, and it may not just be, it's their symptoms all come back when they kind of push themselves too much. So it's really important to screen for that because the treatment for that is that they need to pace and not push themselves and need to know what takes them to that, whether that be, you know, their heart rate goes up a certain amount, does their saturation start dropping before they get to that um, and a lot of times just showing people how to control to not push it will help them feel better. And so this is also, it's part of one of the diagnostic criteria for myalgic encephalomyelitis as well. So post-viral fatigue, like I said, most uh, big thing, a lot of it, some of the phenotypes of those, some are just fatigue that they can exercise out of, and some are the more severe fatigue with the post-exertional malaise that look like myalgia encephalomyelitis, and you cannot over-exercise those people. You can't say, just work it out, just go work harder, because they will crash, and they will do worse, and they will just get into, um, you know, uh, this really bad cycle of crashes and not getting any better. These patients still need pulmonary and cardiac screens. You have to rule out other things. I check vitamin levels. Um, and, you know, B12, B6, B1. B6, again, can cause a neuropathy both high and low. And I'm seeing a lot of high B6. Check vitamin D because people are, it's, you know, they're in, they feel bad, their vitamin D is really low. A lot of them will have viral reactivations. And we've seen that as being one of the risk factors for getting long COVID. So check PCR for some viruses, especially EBV. Um, there are MECFS tiered testing recommendations that are available online that are excellent about what else can you test for, and you probably find something kind of abnormal there. You want to see how they're sleeping. I've talked about therapy and exercise, but again, they cannot be exercised to fatigue some of these patients because they will crash and burn and do worse. 
And then, you know, otherwise it's a holistic approach to decreasing inflammation, uh, making sure that they sleep, doing breathing exercises, especially if there's breathing pattern dysfunctions, which we talked about them having a lot of, you know, very um, over breathing, especially when they're doing activities. Um, and I will sometimes, de- if someone's having a very allergic response, we'll do antihistamines, non-sedating antihistamines, and then enhance external counterpulsions, a treatment that they've used before an unstable angina, but has been helpful in my patients also who have long COVID. So uh, in my last couple of minutes, please, you know, let patients want to be heard. They want to be validated. They want to know that there's options because this is affecting their life very substantially and they want to know that there's things that they can do, whether that be, you know, breathing exercises, figuring out how to do pacing and how to do, you know, um, energy conservation techniques to help them feel better and that there may be, you know, medications to trial. These patients really need work accommodations if they're working um, or support or time off for disability. One of the worst things, like I said, physical and mental exertion causes crash because mental exertion is almost is harder than physical exertion. So someone might feel like they're okay at home and they go to work and that's when they have the crash because of the, the cognitive part of it. And so it's okay to give patients some time off to recover if they need a, you know, a few more work weeks off from work. Um, then, you know, give them that, fill out that FMLA for giving them a little bit more time for recovery and letting their body recuperate because otherwise there can be relapses and um, probably reasonable reentry back to work. If I can get this graduated return back to work program, those are the people who are most successful. If someone's in the healthcare field, if it's a nurse that can do part-time or day shifts or, you know, put a Monday, Wednesday, Friday instead of a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then it gives them kind of some time to rest in between. Um, of course, knowing social determinants of health, not everyone can get those kind of accommodations. And these are some other things I will do for patients with fatigue and brain fog. At the beginning, you know, if I have to limit their hours, make sure that they get breaks, have, give them handicap parking so that they're close to their work and they're not using all their energy, allowing patient people to work from home if they need to, then monitoring themselves at home. Um, big thing that you can do for your patients is get them into trials. We have the Recover Study. We're one of the sites, uh, only one here in Texas, and that's the phone number there. So get your patient enrolled. First, we're kind of looking at following what's happening, and then we are also looking at treatments for long COVID. And so these patients will be able to try those trials as well. Thank you. My take-home points in my last minute, we don't have a universal treatment yet, and everyone's different. They all have to be looked at holistically and we have to treat them safe and effectively look kind of make sure you rule out other things i always say like you know cancer doesn't stop because of covid or you know make sure we're doing all the usual stuff that you do for your patients and validate them and encourage research so thank you very much um, thank you so much. That was a tour de force uh, through a very complex topic, and um, you you did it very well. And I know that there's going to be a lot of questions. And while people are thinking about the questions that they, I hope, will put in the chat, um, I would like to ask you if you could just review with us. We got the message that there's this recover study, and that's open to anybody that we think uh, may fit the definition of a post COVID or long COVID. Um, could you unpack a little bit what are the criteria that should lead us to refer a patient to your specialty clinic or one like it? So hmm, that's a great point. Myself, again, I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, so I, but I'm used to dealing patients with brain injury and patients who have chronic diseases related to their brain. Like we said, long COVID also, we know there's inflammation there. We know that, you know, inflammation crosses into the blood brain barrier and the, the symptoms are very similar to patients I've treated with other types of brain injuries. Um, say if that you can refer if, you know, you really try to go through and have you ruled out everything, you know, have you gone through some of the, the different workups 
um, depending on what they have. I want you to at least start with something before they refer, refer, because the worst thing is when I get a patient and they've had nothing yet. So I kind of want to be like, make sure they've had at least basic labs, basic screens, you know, vitamin levels, check their sleep, the things that I talked about, uh, you know, if they're having joint pains, ANA and, you know, everything else that comes with that. If they are uh, having neurologic symptoms, maybe more labs related to that. And, um, but also I've worked with therapy partners in our community. So a lot of places are starting to learn how to treat patients who have long COVID as well. And of course, if there's a huge physical or neurologic deficit, then you know, we're happy to see them in our COVID recovery clinic. So if I could paraphrase and summarize, it sounds like you would appreciate if primary care doctors, primary care providers would initiate at least the initial workup that we would have done maybe before COVID in evaluating a patient that is complaining of chronic fatigue and and some of these other kinds of symptoms. So do that first. And when we conclude that, gee, this really seems to be COVID related and we're not sure what else we can do, then refer up a level. Refer up a level, but get them involved in maybe some rehabilitation also, at, you know, okay, well, maybe they need a, to do energy conservation and need to go to OT for that, or you know, maybe someone needs to, you know, make, see if they have autonomic dysfunction and work them up for that. All right, Dr. Tess Barton has joined us. She's from Pediatric Infectious Diseases. I'm glad to see you, Dr. Barton, because I know you're going to have a case for us in a little bit. But Dr. Barton has asked, is the RECOVER study enrolling only adults or also adolescents? I'm going to ask Dr. Jan Patterson to, to feel that one, if you don't mind, Dr. Patterson, because I know you're an investigator. On the so that's, uh, that study is for 18 years of age or older. And actually, uh, they're enrolling uh, COVID patients, but also people that have not had COVID to serve as controls in this study. So if you haven't had COVID but are interested in participating in this study, you can also um, contact us. Excellent. Um, Crystal Chavez is asking, are there any other recommendations to improve mind fog and cognitive issues besides rest? And I'd like to ask Dr. Ratna Sanka, who is our Vice Chair of Neurology, who's been looking at neurologic aspects of post-COVID. Um, Dr. Sanka, could you unmute and address this question about what else can be done to improve mind fog and cognitive issues? Uh, thank you. Um, that's a great question. And I think it's a loaded question because there's a lot of things that can contribute to the fog and sleep. And as Dr. Gutierrez mentioned, we need to make sure uh, we rule out any associated uh, metabolic changes like vitamin deficiencies or, um, you know, there's a lot of um, psycho, uh, psychosocial issues with depression and anxiety related to the uh, um, COVID-related um, you know, stay in house and changes with the schools and the families are disrupted. Uh, so all of, we need to address the comorbid issues. And if there are nothing found, then trying to regularize a sleep regimen and, um, you know, working on um, a scheduling sleep, avoiding um, factors that can worsen sleep. There are, um, you know, medications that, we are, that can affect the sleep and cognition. So it's going to be a multimodal approach. Um, and, um, and I don't think there is a single answer. It's trying to rule out comorbidities and trying to approach more holistically on treating their sleep um, with maybe some short acting medications, keeping in mind that some of them can worsen fog, the brain fog. So we have to balance the brain fog versus the medication related uh, benefits of sleep. So Okay, thank you. A lot of uh, action for the primary care providers there in reviewing a person's medication list and um, life habits. And Dr. Barton, we see your question about the disrupted sleep cycle. I think Dr. Senka addressed them as best she could uh, for the state of our understanding at this time. Um, if you had something else you wanted to add for Dr. Barton about anything in particular related to COVID sleep disruption, post-COVID sleep disruption that's new or different other than what we have all learned in primary care. Okay, sounds like not. Um, Joaquin Abrego, who is uh, uh, one of our community health 
workers. Sorry, and- I did have an answer that. Okay. So patients with ME-CFS and that phenotype, actually that's one of the diagnostic criteria is the non-restorative sleep. So again, it looks into, okay, now screen them for autonomic dysfunction, screen them for, moder- for the post-exertional malaise. And yeah, so it's part of that as well. And those patients are really hard to treat. And does screening for autonomic dysfunction, does that require a referral to a cardiologist? Dr. Pilarosetti, are you with us? Uh, Yes. Uh, So I think evaluation of uh, a post-COVID path syndrome patient is, uh, uh, it cannot be limited to certain study, certain uh, laboratory tests. I think it has to be uh, very uh, empiric in terms of, you know, you need to get the basic labs, then we need to make sure that there's no structural heart disease. You know, initially, we know, because there are a lot of patients who also have heart failure as part of uh, post-COVID uh, uh, disease. So make sure, making sure that there's no structural heart disease, making sure there's no arrhythmias contributing to the symptoms, making sure they do not have heart failure. And once all these are normal, then uh, we, will, we will then attribute it to uh, POTS uh, or in a, inappropriate sinusitis cardia or autonomic dysfunction. And that can be diagnosed with, uh, of course, a... Uh, 10 minute stand test, but we also want to rule out structural heart disease. And once we do find out that this is POTS, then we would begin treatment and then refer them to neurology as well. All right. So for the primary care provider in the, in the clinic, in our community, it sounds as though it would be appropriate if people are having symptoms that would suggest autonomic dysfunction that might suggest POTS, the primary care provider may want to get the echocardiogram taken care of to rule out the structural problems, as well as an EKG uh, before referring them in. Should primary care providers be ordering um, 24-hour Holter monitors or 48 hours or just a, just a plain EKG? What, what would you like to see done before you receive a referral? I think it depends on the patient's symptoms. If they are complaining of palpitations or episodes of lightheadedness, then they can order either a 48-hour monitor or a 14-day event monitor. Uh, but if the patients do, do not have any complaints of palpitations, then an echo should be fine. An EKG and an echo should be fine. All right. Thank you. Um, and I will now go to the question from Joaquin Abrego, um, one of our community health workers and outreach coordinators. Joaquin asked, could things like listening to classical music and viewing art stimulate mental health uh, with patients that have long COVID brain fog? And I'll invite Dr. Senka to comment first. Um, I think there is um, a lot of um, alternative uh, methods we are trying to utilize. Um, Again, uh, we know some things about COVID, but we we do not know a lot of things um, still about it. Um, There is some data on on using some of these methodologies to help with um, concentration and with um, anxiety and depression control, and some of those can contribute to your brain fog. So, um, using things in this issue in this way are uh, should be beneficial. But again, we do not have um, any data with studies or randomized studies. But you know, more more information and more studies are needed to help us uh, with this. Well, while we're on the subject of um, complementary and alternative approaches to addressing physical problems, I'd like to call on Dr. Jan Patterson, who has done advanced training and a completed a fellowship in integrative medicine. Um, Dr. Patterson, what are some of the modalities from integrative medicine that have been showing promise in helping people with post-COVID? Uh, well, acupuncture is one, um, and I'm going to talk in my um, case presentation about some others, some, some um, dietary supplements uh, and some sleep measures that, that we have from, from integrative medicine, which I'll mention in the, the patient that I'm going to present. Well, that's a great segue. And uh, so I'm mindful of the time. I appreciate all the questions in the chat, but we have several good cases that we want to get to now. And so Dr. Patterson, um, we agreed that you would go first um, with your case, which is a case, by the way, that is already known to others on our panel of experts. Um, But could you present the case for us and land with a question? Sure. So I'm presenting a 58-year-old female who 
presented with fatigue and neuropathy symptoms after COVID, and she was referred in August of 2021 to our integrative medicine clinic. She had a febrile upper respiratory illness in March of 2020. COVID testing was not yet available for the general public, uh, but this was thought to be COVID. She states that she had brain fog after that with less ability to concentrate, difficulty getting out words, and difficulty remembering things. And then in July of 2020, which is about four months after her presumed COVID, she had a sensation of a hot tongue and some decreased hearing in her left ear and tinnitus. In November of 2020, approximately eight months after her presumed COVID, she began to feel tingling in her toes all the time and her feet felt cold. She also had pain and swelling in her knees left greater than right. She was prescribed gabapentin for neuropathy and took 300 milligrams daily. Uh, and states that the level of pain in her toes was now in the range of 3 of 10 uh, on gabapentin when she was at rest. She saw rheumatology and was negative for lupus and, and rheumatoid arthritis, but she had a positive ANA at 1 to 640 and an elevated SED rate. She was given a medrol dose pack, uh, and uh, that helped a little with the knee and leg pain. She was also prescribed some hydroxychloroquine for the anti-inflammatory uh, aspect, um, and she took that for a couple of months but stopped it due to a decreased white count. Then in February of 2021, she had nasal congestion, low-grade fever, and loss of taste and smell, and at that time, she did test positive for, cover, for COVID and recovered her taste and smell after about two months. However, she continued to have the neuropathy pain, which she described as sharp and making it difficult for her to walk. The pain was worsened when walking, but even when she wasn't walking, it caused her to move around. She could not stay in one position for a long period of time. The pain was always present. It never completely went away. It impacted her daily activities and limited her walking. She was referred to physical therapy, and this helped some. She was still having brain fog, and, uh, and also uh, she was having insomnia, and uh, she decided to retire early than planned from her, her job in the Air Force due to these health difficulties. She also was having generalized itching. She uh, was exploring on the internet, and she found uh, what she termed as the COVID long hauler sites on the internet and discovered uh, the uh, clinic here at UT uh, Long School of Medicine, and uh, she sought care there in June of 2021 with Dr. Gutierrez, who recommended a neurology evaluation and consideration for a nerve biopsy for small fiber neuropathy and an autoimmune neural panel. And that's at that time she was referred to integrative medicine. Uh, her social situation is that she lives with her husband and grandson, and she cites that her largest source of stress is raising her seven-year-old autistic grandson. Uh, her past history is hypothyroidism, hyperlipidemia. Uh, she uh, has um, also a family history of uh, lung disease. Right now, she's taking uh, vitamin D, and she take, uses fluticasone for seasonal allergies. She also takes levothyroxine for her hypothyroidism and a multivitamin. Her view of symptoms are really, all, as we've already mentioned, uh, her physical exam was remarkable for uh, a BMI of 34. Uh, her tongue was dry and slightly pale. And then her neurologic exam, uh, she was oriented to person, place, and time. She did not have any motor weakness um, that was detected. She did have some pain on walking. She had a decreased patella reflex, and her proprioception was intact to my exam, and her pinprick was intact to, to her lower extremity toes. So she appeared to be a post-COVID syndrome patient with symptoms of lower extremity neuropathy, brain fog, insomnia, and some fatigue. She wanted to try acupuncture for some of these, and we decided to focus on neuropathy and insomnia first. So she, went under, uh, she underwent acupuncture for these. She was also started on ashwagandha, uh, which is a supplement uh, for, uh, and we use this for her stress and insomnia. She took that in the evening, and she was also instructed in the use of essential oils and her diffuser for sleep support. She was instructed in breathing techniques for relaxation and parasympathetic sympathetic activation, especially for her times of stress, and she experienced improvement with uh, these measures. Her itching also resolved.
She saw neurology then, and it showed that her strength was intact, but she had absent vibration in her toe and patchy proprioception loss, reduced temperature in both feet, and her gait was antalgic but not ataxic. She was started on alpha-lipoic acid uh, for the peripheral neuropathy pain and had an EMG that suggested left perineal perineal neuropathy. And that did not really explain her symptoms, so a skin biopsy was done and was consistent with small fiber neuropathy thought to be post-viral. She continued with acupuncture treatments for neuropathy and relaxation every three to four weeks over the next nine months that she said it helped her a lot. Um, and she was last seen in our clinic uh, this month and reported that she's now walking for an hour daily. Her knee pain had resolved. She, she was uh, also doing yoga, which she was able to do that again. Um, and so for the panel, could you comment on the delay in the onset of her neuropathy symptoms in this patient? And how common is that in, in the post-COVID syndrome? Thank you, Dr. Patterson. That was um, very detailed and it brings to life that case presentation, uh, the, the real experience of, of people who are suffering from this problem. Um, could we ask Dr. Sanka, our neurologist, vice chair of neurology, to address Dr. Patterson's question first? Um, again, when, you know, I had the, the opportunity to see this patient, but that, you know, we have seen patients presenting uh, months later with some of these symptoms. And um, unfortunately, we do not have a true um, patho pathogenesis or a pathophysiology and how this is happening. Um, there are some theories. Is there reactivation, a viral reactivation syndrome? Is it that slow, with their slow return to work, they are getting to their pre-infection um, baseline activity and that that activity is causing post-exertional symptoms and bringing out some of these um, neurological um, illnesses. Um, you know, again, there is, you know, we're seeing it, but we do not have a good explanation. And I'm hoping the, the recover studies and some other studies will put in more uh, light on this um, presentation. Question for you. Um, so the pathology actually documented small fiber neuropathy. So I think that's one important point to stress. People with post-COVID who say they hurt, they're not crazy. You can biopsy them and you can look under the microscope and you can find pathology. Now, it was mentioned that this patient received alpha-lipoic acid. Um, what is the evidence behind alpha-lipoic acid in this kind of uh, situation? And either Dr. Senka or Dr. Patterson is welcome to answer the question. Um, I, I, I'll go first and then Dr. Patterson can add it, add it later. Um, the, most of the data on alpha lipoic acid um, is present in um, diabetic neuropathy studies where we have seen a small and large fiber neuropathy um, as a related, um, in, due to the oxidative stress um, and advanced glycosylated end products causing oxidative damage to the, to the neurons. Um, and we are borrowing um, some of the existing information because we are seeing similar patterns of neuropath neuropathy symptoms and utilizing it in other uh, people who other situations, even if we do not have a true etiology or if it is post-viral, um, as a way to treat the uh, oxidative stress uh, with an antioxidant and helping symptoms. And we've seen patients benefit um, from the treatment. And it is especially useful in some of our post-COVID syndrome patients because all of the neuropathic agents come in with some amount of sedation, which can worsen their cognitive brain fog. So we, we try to use things that have the least amount of um, cognitive um, dysfunction as a side effects, and this one would be on the top of the list. Right, so uh, gabapentin comes to mind as something we often reach for uh, when people are having nerve-related pain, and yet that can really exacerbate brain fog. Dr. Patterson, did you want to add uh, comments to the alpha-lipoic acid or other modalities for dealing with the pain of the small fiber neuropathy? Well, I, I don't really have anything to add. As Dr. Sanka pointed out, most of the data on the alpha-lipoic acid or ALA is in diabetic ne uh, neuropathy, and so uh, this you know, we are also using it for other types of neuropathy as well. And I, I didn't uh, go into detail about the gabapentin on this patient, but she ended up stopping it just because of the side effects, because of the grogginess and brain fog that it caused. So while gabapentin can be helpful for neuropathy, the side effects are, are troublesome for many patients. 
And uh, is there evidence that uh, acupuncture is helpful in this particular group of patients? Yes, there are publications showing that acupuncture is helpful. And then I might also mention there has been some evidence uh, about uh, geranium, uh, essential oil, uh, which of course needs to be diluted if it's going to be applied topically. But there has also been some evidence about that for helping with neuropathy pain. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to uh, two questions in the chat, and then we're going to go to a um, to Dr. Sanka's case. Dr. Campbell, who is an internist, is asking, is there experience with COVID deniers who clearly have long COVID syndrome? How likely are they to be receptive to accepting the diagnosis and management recommendations, advice on the approach to this population? And uh, Jason Rosenfeld asks a question that he thinks is a good follow-up to that one. What are the key messages we should promote in clinical and community settings to help people in our community understand long COVID and the services and support that they can access? So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Gutierrez, our didactic presenter, to address those questions first. All right, so definitely there are still COVID deniers, and you know, some patients may tell, I lost so much weight and I'm so fatigued and um, I lost my sense of smell and taste, but I never had COVID. Oh, okay, great. Um, and, but I just then look at it as, well, let's treat the end symptom that you have. Okay, if you're saying you're having diarrhea and you're losing weight and you're fatigued, then let's work, let's work that up. And so maybe try to, you know, just since everything unfortunately has become very politicized is take it away from the political aspect and say like, okay, well now let's look at your health, let's look at your body and let's treat the symptoms that you're having right now. And maybe not putting that label on it for people who don't want that label, even though that's what it's related to, but just so that we can ensure that they're getting that the health care that they want. Dr. Dr. Gutierrez just showed us um, the technique of active listening um, and setting a respectful tone um, and then being very skillful in bridging from what the patient may believe to what you want to help them with, what you want them to remember. So thank you for demonstrating um, some of the uh, skills that we've been emphasizing throughout this health literacy panel. Yes, to the next point. And then to the next point is, you know, what are the key messages for our community is that, you know, I'm still saying, you know, COVID is, is not over, that there are still millions of people that we talked about who are suffering with the effects of long COVID, and we cannot deny their existence, we cannot deny that they're not getting back to work, that they're struggling, that they have medical issues, that we need to, you know, be promoting them to be in the trials, to be seeing their their healthcare practitioners and getting the care that they need. So this could be an opportunity to help build trust again with our community and our healthcare providers, especially if we invite people in who are suffering to engage in, in, in a study, right, to learn more. Um, all right, I'm gonna move now to uh, Dr. Sanka's case. Dr. Sanka, you have a case to present. Let me unmute myself. I think I, two years into or three years into the Zoom era, I still find myself talking muted. So, so uh, my um, patient is a 49-year-old uh, female with a past medical history of asthma and depression um, who actually presented from the post-COVID um, clinic uh, from Dr. Gutierrez to the neurology clinic for this progressive weakness and myalgias. Um, her symptoms started in June um, uh, of 2020, um, when she was, uh, she had uh, COVID with um, fever, uh, body aches, um, but she was not hospitalized and, um, and she recovered at home with rest and um, no specific treatments needed, um, no oxygen, no steroids, um, but she had persistent fatigue, um, which she was getting over, but unfortunately in October of the same year, she got reinfected um, with, this, uh, with the, the COVID-19 again was tested and it was, and it was proven to be COVID-19 reinfection um, uh, with mild cold symptoms. Um, she recovered with the continuing fatigue, but again, just like what we saw with Dr. Um, Patterson's patient, four months later, she started noticing weakness, um, which was worse than, um, which was more progressive along with muscle pain in these cold hands and feet. Um, at the same time, she noted um, worsening um, of her pre-existing migraines, um, changes in her vision, which were described as blurry vision and harder to hard time focusing, 
episodic lightheadedness palpitations. Um, she also started having recurrent uh, urinary tract infections with some frequency urgency. Um, and again, she never had these um, before um, the second um, episode of these infection. Um, and she, um, with irritable bowel syndrome um, and also progressive memory changes, um, she was uh, uh, she had to quit work um, because of the memory changes and these progressive um, neurological symptoms. Um, she had a workup um, with the um, um, with us um, again. She was vaccinated in between the first and the second case, um, and she was an office manager, but had to um, quit um, her work because of these uh, neurological illnesses. Um, she, because of all the progressive changes, she had a, a workup with neurology. Um, and, um, and when we did a neurological workup, um, she was found, found to have some elevated um, markers of inflammation uh, with a positive ANA. Um, if we can move down the screen um, to the next part. Um, and um, she had a, a significant high titers of ANA um, with the elevated RNP antibodies um, and a low ferritin. Um, rest of the workup with imaging um, nerve conduction studies were normal. In this patient, we did uh, follow up with the skin biopsy because she had these paresthesias in the, in the skin, um, cold feelings suggesting a neuropathic pattern. But in her, the skin biopsy was normal, um, um, suggesting um, you know, symptoms without any obvious um, neurological um, damage on the, on the studies. Um, she, um, on exam in the clinic, her exam was normal, uh, but she did have this orthostatic intolerance. Now, um, she had a 20-beat increase in her heart rate. Um, to call it a diagnosis of POTS or a postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, we need a heart rate increase of 30 beats. Um, in on standing within um, 10 minutes of standing. Um, again, she did not qualify um, the criteria, but she was having symptomatic tachycardia on, um, on evaluation in the clinic. Um, and with the 20 beats, she did have symptoms. So she would qualify as an orthostatic uh, intolerance. Um, and, um, what I want to kind of stress on this area is there are episodes when there may be higher than 30. So just having a clinical evaluation in the clinic and not meeting criteria does not completely rule out uh, autonomic symptoms. Um, the, the key points with her is um, she had a, a, a COVID infection, but then she eventually, a few months later, started having progressive symptoms and on evaluation was found to have an autoimmune disease with her RNP antibodies and the uh, and the ANA. So in her, the, the post-viral syndrome precipitated an autoimmune um, syndrome, and she had to be evaluated by rheumatology and started on treatments. Um, the second point um, is the multi-organ involvement, which, um, which she, as we have seen, she has GI involvement with um, uh, alternating diarrhea, constipation, uh, UTIs uh, suggesting urogenital involvement, uh, cardiovascular involvement with tachycardia, um, which uh, would um, put, uh, put her, uh, her in this multi-organ involvement. And I'm going to kind of um, reach out to Dr. Gutierrez, um, how, you know, not everybody has access to a multidisciplinary care, which would be ideal for management of these patients. So how can we make sure um, a, a condition like post-acute COVID syndrome, where there is multi-organ involvement, that we provide all the multidisciplinary care um, to the patients who need it without a multidisciplinary clinic. I'm going to stop right there. Thank you so much. Um, two cases back to back that each had evidence of more than one COVID infection, right? And also the delayed onset of the, of the chronic symptoms by, by months. Thank you so much, Dr. Senka. And so you had a question for our presenter, Dr. Verdusco Gutierrez, um, about multimodal management. Are you with us? I'm with us, and I'm like, well, does someone have a lot of money and they want to donate to our university so we can have more access to multidisciplinary care? That would be the most amazing thing. But um, it's also, um, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's giving, you know, you have to address everything that is going on, but sometimes it's, I know it's very limited in a primary care clinic and how much time you see that patient. And so it's also maybe saying, okay, today let's address two things and then come back in two weeks and we'll address another two things. And in the interim, like I said, 
use referrals that we talked about. So maybe you don't have multidisciplinary in your own clinic, but there may be other, you know, a speech therapist that knows how to help patients with brain fog and help them with their memory. There may be, you know, a physical therapist that can help them control their pain that they're having from their new joint pain or who knows how to deal with autonomic dysfunction and can do some of the physical therapy that patients who have POTS need. You know, so it's, you know, using these types of treatments that we know are available in our community and getting that to the patient, even if it may not be right in your center. Thank you so much for that. Um, that uh, caused me to wonder about uh, peer support groups. Um, is that also another modality, a tool that we can deploy to help people who have multi-system problems for which there are no clear answers? And I think, yes, that's so true that we I feel that patients are so empowered with this because they've gone to social media groups, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook groups together, and they're providing each other with education and reading things. And this helped me try this, have they worked up this? And so that's great when a patient has access that, to that kind of care and know that exists and has you know, Wi-Fi and social media and time to do that and health, has health literacy, which we know not everyone does. So if that is available and accessible and there's some support groups even locally and in Texas, that's wonderful. Thank you. So we, we are uh, getting up against time, but I wanted to acknowledge Dr. Tess Barton spent a lot of time putting together a pediatric case for us. We don't have time for the entire case, but Dr. Barton, if you're still with us, would you mind um, giving us a couple, a, a question or two um, from your case that, that might be helpful? Sure. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Um, th th sorry that I was a little bit late. I was on rounds. Um, so, uh, so my just a brief summary of, of my patient is that um, I, uh, I had a 14-year-old boy who was referred to my infectious disease clinic um, by his primary care doctor, um, and he had had um, a very mild COVID case in um, January, and uh, which is like mild URI, minimal other symptoms. His whole family was sick. He had received two doses of vaccine previously. And then um, following that, a week or so after he began developing like knee pain and fatigue, it's a regular healthy ninth grader with just some allergies, but otherwise no other medical problems. And, his, and, and really his, his com concern was that he had like playing basketball, he just had poor stamina and he just felt like he wasn't performing the way he used to perform and was just tired all the time. And his mom was concerned that he was tired all the time and taking afternoon naps um, and just not as active as he used to be. He had a very positive review of systems with many things, you know, aching and, and paining um, and in a very, very normal physical exam. Um, so no joint swelling, no abnormalities on his neurologic exam. Everything was fine. Um, his pediatrician had referred him to a cardiologist um, who had done an EKG but didn't do any other, any other workup and cleared him and said he was okay to play. Um, and so I guess my question is, you know, what's the expected timeline of recovery for, you know, the sort of soon after infection, post COVID type of, you know, fatigue or decreased stamina and really how aggressive should a primary care doctor or a pediatrician be in working up cardiac or neurologic complications? Excellent. Thank you so much. Very efficiently done. Um, Dr. Uh, Bredusco Gutierrez, do you want to start with that one? Sure. I think, like I said, you have to make sure the workup's complete and that you work through it. Because again, we don't know what's going to happen long term with this. I always say, you know, I take care of post polio patients and they didn't have something for decades later. And so, you know, we still don't know, but doing a comprehensive workup for the patient, looking at their symptoms, trying to, um, you know, also doing pacing even for adolescents as well, just like you would for a concussion patient. You wouldn't say like, go back to sport, go back to school right away. The same thing that you would want them to pace and get back and give them accommodations to be able to get back to activity and then roll out the cardiac stuff and anything else that can develop. We're seeing also a lot of mental health issues 
in teens and adolescents and young adults, including, you know, manic breaks and needing to be hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. And there is infl- real neuroinflammation that happens after infections and after COVID. So it isn't just, oh, they're depressed or, but, you know, it's a trigger for psychiatric issues. Thank you. It's unfortunate that our recovery study uh, requires people to be 18 years and older, right? So that's going to be a great database that's going to help us answer these types of questions, but it's not necessarily going to apply to kids. Dr. Barton, back to you. Is, are there long COVID studies that have been started for children, people under the age of 18? You know, there, there are that are being done by other centers. We're not involved with them. And actually, uh, so I was going to say, maybe there needs to be a recovered junior if, if there's not. Excellent. And if Dr. Pilarosetti is here, would you have done an echocardiogram on this 14-year-old boy who was having chest tightness and when playing basketball? Would that have been appropriate? Uh, yes, definitely, because uh, there are some studies on athletes who have had cardiac MRIs, and uh, there was some scarring noted on in the hearts of athletes. Again, um, the study was limited uh, because uh, there were no MRIs that were done before COVID, so we do not have a baseline. Uh, but at least we do have some evidence that uh, acute COVID and after that, there is involvement of the heart. The virus has been isolated from, some, from the endothelial cells and myocytes. So it can cause scarring. So if patient has chest pain, I would at least start with an echo if not. And, and if that's normal, then depending on you know, how the symptoms are and if they're persistent, I may even do a cardiac MRI. Excellent. Of course, uh, patient's insurance status will dictate um, how far we can go with some of those workups. But um, we really, really appreciate your expertise. It's now 102. I want to take a moment to uh, thank um, Dr. Monica Verdusco Gutierrez for her excellent didactic presentation and review. There was a lot of literature that came at us very thick and fast, and this session was recorded. So we will have access to it, and we can go back and we can pause when she put those articles in front of us, and we can go and look them up and, and read read more about this. So thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Patterson, for your case um, and your comments on integrative medicine. Um, Dr. Pilarosetti, cardiologist from the field, um, (laughs) on your way to do your next cath, it looks like. Thank you for being with us. Um, Dr. Senka from from our neurology department. I hope I didn't miss anybody. But for those of you who have COVID, long COVID questions and would like to present cases, we are going to be running this session again. Um, this whole series will be run again. And now that you see how great it is to have the opportunity to present your case to a panel of experts, we hope you'll be highly motivated to, to submit your cases. Um, and you know how to do that because we send everybody who's a registrant a PDF form that allows you to submit a case. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our ECHO team. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for Dr. Bergen to be our lead specialist. Thank you for the Confianza team and for the ECHO. Um, thank you. That was an excellent discussion. We invite you again to submit cases and you receive the information from the ECHO administration. And also the CME, CNE Credit Genetic Continuum Medical Education is in the chat. Thank you for everyone to participate in our chat and our conversation. Uh, please complete the post session feedback survey that is in the chat. And my final comments is our next session is going to be Friday the 3rd at noon, the same time. It's going to be on Friday. So until then, please take care and I will see you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.